Welcome, everyone. My name is Steve Jacobs. I'm a venture partner at Lakestar. We're a multi-stage uh, pan-European venture capital firm. I help lead the deep tech investment thesis. Um, we are uh, honored to be investors in Izar. I think I've talked to every company that's up here at some point, all great companies. Um, but they are the stars of today, so I'm going to keep my introduction very short. Uh, today's talk is obviously the future of the space economy. We have a number of great companies with us. And I will turn it over to Nicholas to kick us off on introductions. Uh, sure. So are we playing the videos now or are we doing that later with the... No idea. Okay, perfect. I'll just go ahead. Uh, my name is Nicholas uh, Mechtesheimer. Um, I'm leading operations uh, for the exploration company. Um, we at the exploration company develop, manufacture, and operate uh, spacecraft that will service space stations. Um, that's a market that is projected to grow about 400% in the next uh, 10 years. So there were two space stations orbiting the Earth right now. Um, by 2030, we expect there'll probably be around eight. Uh, well, further four orbiting the Earth than two orbiting the Moon. So it's a big market. It's going to be a big market. Um, yeah, I'll just keep it short like that. Perfect. So my name is Josef Fleischmann. I'm one of the founders and uh, chief operating officer at ESA Aerospace. Uh, founded four years ago uh, right here uh, out of the Technical University of Munich. Uh, out of actually a research student group interested in all space technologies, uh, starting from satellites to uh, rockets, hyperloops, which uh, the competition which we famously several times won, transformed it into a company in 2018 uh, with uh, three co-founders and grown so far to uh, 300 people almost. Um, our product, quite simple, a uh, rocket that transports uh, small to medium uh, satellites into space up to one metric ton, and doing that in a very competitive, uh, uh, market-wise competitive way, uh, and therefore trying to uh, uh, revolutionize the access to space uh, away from the old and rigid companies who have uh, been doing this for decades uh, to a non-state dependent private uh, uh, market uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, right on the way. Hello everyone, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spaceforge. We're an in-space manufacturing company building the world's first fully returnable and relaunchable satellite platform, the Forge Star. The reason we're doing this is to leverage the unique benefits of the space environment, microgravity, high purity vacuum, and plus or minus 250 Celsius to create products which are simply impossible to manufacture on Earth. Going to space enables about a billion new alloy combinations across our known periodic table. Not all of them are useful, but the 1% that are offer really a way to shift the narrative in how we think about industry back on Earth. So for example, by producing semiconductors in space, you can lower uh, energy consumption back on the ground by about 60%. What that mean, And that means that for every kilogram we create as Space Forge of CO2, we can prevent up to 80 tons of CO2 from being created on Earth. How that works is really through the operational efficiency once these technologies are deployed into something like 5G, electric vehicle architecture, renewable energy. In something like renewable energy, we can enable a grid level improvement nationally of about 10%. Now, 10% grid improvement doesn't sound like much. Uh, and this, <laughs> I appreciate I'm now in Germany when I'm going to say this, but this is roughly about the same as building a new nuclear power station. So you really don't need to do that anymore. Um, the way that our return technology works as well, uh, I describe as Mary Poppins, but from space. Uh, if you're less familiar with that film, it's essentially a large deployable umbrella which allows us to return much more sustainably and gently from space than some of the more traditional ablative methods. What that means is that compared to some of the vehicles in operation today, we come back with comparably about 1% of the kinetic energy. And for, for the first time ever, you can fully refurbish and relaunch a satellite. Launch has come down, as we know, $5,000 a kilogram on a SpaceX rideshare. When we started Spaceforge, it was about $35,000 per kilogram. But the cost of building a satellite hasn't changed in 20 years. It's still about $50,000 per kilogram just to get to low Earth orbit. Even being able to take that by 10, 20% will really change how we interact with the space environment in a far more sustainable capacity. Uh, so pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris. I'm part of the founding team of uh, Reflex Aerospace, and you brought a very good handover uh, there to Reflex Aerospace um, because actually our satellites are built uh, faster, much more faster than uh, the incumbents or uh, classic space companies would do it. 
Normally, to build a satellite, it takes up to four to seven years. It costs double-digit million euros uh, to produce them. Uh, we bring it down to nine months and the one-digit million euro uh, to uh, produce them. So it's very fast. Um, it's uh, cheaper, and uh, the humanity's data hunger um, is just so so big that from 400 satellites being launched uh, this uh, these years, it's going to be up to 30,000 in 2030. A um, couple of mega constellations, many small constellations, and that's actually where we're going into. Our customers are governmental uh, customers, um, also defense and security, um, but we're hitting um, more on the commercial side, so telecommunication, um, autonomous driving, these are our topics we want to tackle with our satellites and broadband communication, and i um, happy to be here. Thank you very much. Awesome. So welcome. This is such a diverse panel when you think about the space economy from satellites to manufacturing to launch vehicles to transportation within space. Um, I wanted to maybe kick it off talking about uh, as we calibrate what we're doing here in Europe relative to what other geographies are doing, whether it's in the US or, or in China or elsewhere, if you'd like, uh, how do you see kind of new space evolving in Europe relative to these other places? Um, I think the, the length of our introductions is a perfect barometer for uh, how long we should take to, to answer these questions so we can get through a few of them. Who would like to start? So, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think we're just at the start of what we, what we say new space economy in Europe. Um, obviously, the U.S. is far, far um, ahead of us. Um, now, similar to I think the energy transition, we're now going into into really having a focus on new space and new space companies, what they can do. Um, I think a good evidence for that is the the recent European Commission study to build the European satellite constellation, um, that Europe is really putting an effort um, on supporting startups in one way, but really putting a lot of capital into this capital intensive uh, business. Now, for us, it's good because new space is not is not it's not bureaucratic, it's not, um, it's not really national. Um, we see it as entrepreneurial and really decentralized. Um, the entry barriers are getting lower and lower, so it's a good possibility to us to, to tackle that last frontier in Europe. It takes more than the US. I'll, I'll go next, because I think that was a, a perfect handover to, to what I was gonna say. So, um, as you were alluding to, um, we really see the majority of our competition, and when I say our, I mean the exploration companies, so I'll refer to our core market. Right now, um, they have two things in common. They're usually American, and they're usually incumbent. And when I say incumbent, I mean big companies like Boeing, Northrop Grumman, uh, up for debate whether you would call SpaceX incumbent um, at this point. You, you could argue it's a startup, you could argue they're incumbent. Um, but uh, we really see the need um, especially now with what's going on with the war in Ukraine, if that's shown us anything, it's that the EU needs sovereignty. Now, that's true of the energy market. Yeah? That's true of the defense market, and that's also true for space. Okay? Um, and so we see the advantage of really sort of building, building that EU access to you know, space, to being able to transport payloads um, towards uh, space stations uh, within the EU, as advantageous because reason number one, it means uh, less taxpayer dollars or rather taxpayer euros in Europe going to the US all the time, right? So this is good for Europe. And it also means more competition in the US, right? So um, th that is why we really think that, that we're starting something really great here by you know, um, being, I think, honestly, the first uh, company to do um, a, a spaceship, not a launcher, um, but a spaceship. Um, that is European-based, um, yeah. Uh, for me, I actually think that the, um, the, the relationship between what we currently call old space and new space isn't actually helpful to the discussion. I prefer to think of it as really as classical space. If it wasn't for the research that Northrop and Lockheed and ESA and Airbus and NASA had conducted, then Spaceforge wouldn't exist today. The way that I like to think about us is an up-and-coming indie band. Um, but importantly, I think although we can see that there's competition in America and Russia and China and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, what I think is really remarkable about Europe, uh, and okay, formerly for us, the European Union, but I am pleased to say we are in the process of establishing a sub subsidiary right here in Munich, uh, is that despite the capital intensivity 
of space, we are so much more capital efficient right here in Europe. The things that we can do, the things that we can build, and certainly I would echo, the pace at which we can build here is so much better than some of that incumbency that traditionally comes from North America, that Europe is really well positioned to be what I really see as the next space renaissance. Yeah, so I can only second to that. Uh, so because, of course, when you mention the US, when you mention China, uh, Europe is lacking behind. Uh, in terms of conquering that market, uh, especially behind the US. Uh, but what we are actually seeing, and uh, I can fully agree with you, um, we have a lot of talent actually in Europe, um, and we can build on that. So all that we are actually missing, once again, we missed that in the 1990s, where companies like Google only were founded uh, uh, in the United States. Um, with this talent, and now what we're seeing more and more money coming into uh, into the game, we're really starting to understand venture markets, capital markets in Europe, and therefore we think actually we're in an extremely good position to catch up uh, and maybe overtake uh, uh, competition from the US and China. Uh, so I'm actually very positive in that. Great. Uh, when I hear space companies talk about Google, it's always kind of hashtag never again is the, the takeaway I tend to get. Um, so, so you mentioned you know, there's exceptional talent here in Europe. Uh, there's the desire for sovereignty. There's kind of the decentralization, decentralization that's happening within the ecosystem. Um, how does that then tie back to government and the support that the space tech industry, the new space industry, really should seek from government or would benefit from government versus, say, corporate partnerships or private venture capital, that sort of thing? I, I can start on that one. So um, I, I'd answer with two points. I mean, number one, with, with regards to our business again, I don't really see, or we don't really see there necessarily being so much of a difference between governmental clients and corporate clients in the future because um, there will be privately owned space stations in the future. We know this. Um, and there will also be you know, certain, certain payloads that are bought off by um by governments and, and we would sort of offer our service to both of that clientele for the same reason we think it's a good service we think that we can beat any sort of incumbent price by 50 percent because our spacecraft is modular and it can aggregate demand um and it's launcher agnostic um and and you know whether whether you're a governmental body or whether you're a private corporation we think that's attractive so that that's point number one um point number two I think where governments can really support all of us is historically, and, and this is, I guess, what you would call classical space, um, space programs have been developmental. That means the contracts have been development contracts. And they've been development contracts over a very long period. And a lot of, a lot of the time, the programs are late. We know this. A lot of the time, the technical requirements are not met. And then you get into a classic sunk cost analysis where it's like, okay, I've put a, put a billion into this already. Do I stop or do I keep going? And, and we really think that the way to solve that or the way to tackle that is to award more service contracts and not development contracts. So that means you're buying payload and you award that payload to whoever can you know, offer the best service at the best price. And I think governments moving towards that model will really, really help the new space economy. So governments as customers instead of just as like research sponsors. Absolutely, yeah. And that, that is actually how it, how it works in the U.S., right? Um, they, they 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 launched uh, for for the for the project, and then SpaceX went. Right, that was the first start of it. And um, what you were Bezos saying is, sues them. sorry, I forgot step three in the process, which is <laughs> Bezos sues them. <laughs> And um, and then in Europe, um, I mean that's that's how big companies work. Like the longer the project uh, takes, the more people I can put in, the more money I get, and that's how how incumbents build all, all up all this workforce. We believe in, in yes, governments entering the game, but having them more as an anchor customer. They they buy bandwidth. That's that's it. Um, but not um, as, a, as, a, as, as getting money from the European Commission or, or, or Germany or, or, or France or whatever um, to subsidize uh, the development costs. It needs to be truly commercially driven. Use cases, there are a lot of them. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming from a position where really we haven't had a government long enough in the UK in the past three years to actually do much engagement with. Um, but I would certainly echo that the uh, the the 
I think the difference, and I think this is really across Europe as a whole, is that there's a need to become um, much more uh, commercially uh, viable faster in Europe than there is in in countries and, and regions where they have these large cost plus type contracts or even or even service contracts. I certainly think service contracts is a way uh, is a place that the UK is moving to, but I think it's moving to it with the European Space Agency. Um, and I am I'm probably the strongest proponent of the European Space Agency that you'll ever meet. And actually, the UK, despite having a national agency, doesn't have the technical capability from a government perspective to understand what we're working on. Um, and and the stopgap for us is that you know frequently we're over in the Netherlands at Estec working with you know people from the 22 member states of the European Space Agency to build that capability. The one thing that I would say uh, remarkably after 2016 that has gotten easier is international talent into the UK. Um, so across Spaceforge, uh, we're currently 40 people, but we represent 17 different countries. Uh, so we've recruited talent from as far east as Japan and as far south as Brazil in order to really accelerate what we're building. And that's allowed us to get to a, a size of team where uh, our first satellite launch is more is only about eight weeks away and we designed, built and qualified that satellite in five months. So from a perspective of ESA Aerospace, uh, I really, or we really love the idea of service contracts. So we don't want uh, development contracts uh, that are coming from the state. Uh, and I think we can actually uh, solve as a good serve as a good example for that, uh, because the European uh, um, uh, the ESA has uh, set up together with uh, national space agencies like DLR last year a program called Commercial Space Transportation System, in which they did exactly that. They said, okay, we want to pull out of uh, the development of launch vehicles in our case. Uh, instead, we just want to act as a, as a customer uh, who wants a really good service, who requires a really good service. Uh, so we won this competition. Uh, and through that, we can now launch our rocket uh, two, uh, two times already. So uh, DLR acts uh, on the first and second flight of our rocket as a customer. Uh, and that is highly important, uh, so they're getting a good price as well, uh, but it's highly important for us to build trust in the private market. Uh, so following the win of this uh, commercial space transportation systems program, we first of all won uh, uh, almost tenfold the amounts of money in private investment, and we also uh, could uh, uh, win additional private customers. So essentially, through giving develop uh, um, through giving service contracts, the state can act much more efficiently with uh, taxpayer money. And I think that is also one of the core points of why new space uh, is such a big factor, and why uh, the private industry keeps pouring. Uh, um, money into it and why we constantly see new companies uh, developing uh, in the space industry. So we, we really believe that uh, in the last few years and also in the coming years, this is becoming more and more a bigger and bigger market, not just uh, uh, state-driven, but really also commercially driven. Got it. Very good. And then kind of building on the theme of... of government, um, how, how have you experienced the, the shifting geopolitical tensions globally start to affect not just your company, but kind of the new space ecosystem as a whole? And I'll, I'll take the easy one so that it, it kind of forces, um, forces us to dive a bit deeper. Obviously, with communication disruption in Ukraine, there was a lot of focus on the capabilities provided by Starlink as one example. I know they're not, it's not the exhaustive um, list, but uh, in that clearly sent a signal up of, hey, should some geopolitical tension arise, we need sovereignty to be a key pillar of, of what we're building. Um, are there other examples where you see shifts in mentality or um, opportunities or challenges, quite frankly, as supply chains localize? I'll, I'll, uh, is it bad if I go? No, I'll, I'll, I'll go first again. So um, I think you, you, you touched on some stuff all there already, uh, and, and I did too. So again, uh, we need sovereign space access in the EU. You know, the, the war in the UK, Ukraine has, has proven that, and I don't think I need to go any deeper than that. I think um, that's clear. Um, however, the conflict between the US and Russia specifically um, will also, uh, we believe, lead to the conclusion of the ISS um, cooperation faster, which will accelerate the privatization of space. Okay? That means space will become private more quickly. Um, we think that you know, um, 
private space stations like the Axiom station might get built quicker. So that's good for us. That, that's a good thing. Um, you talked about challenges too. I'm, I'm an operations guy, so I'm a supply chain guy. I spend my days thinking about aluminum. Let me tell you, ever since the war started. Okay, so um, stuff like aluminum, titanium, um, prices generally across the, the, the raw material range, especially for sort of alloys, 70, 75, 70, 10, that you need to build these sorts of spacecraft are skyrocketing. The lead times are skyrocketing. And you can't do normal, I would say, you know, project management anymore. You need to get creative. Fortunately, I, I really think that the 35 people that we've hired so far have the capability to do this. Um, but it's not easy, so it is a challenge. Uh, I mean, there's no getting around it. Space technology is dual use, so some of the things that sometimes you need for a satellite also goes into a into a warhead to go and, and go and support Ukraine. We've seen that, uh, and but I think I think it's one you know b because of the nature of the situation, it's one that we're you know we're we're okay and we're happy to accept. What I would say though is that the uh, what has I think al alongside that the kind of the other thing has been the chip shortage. You know, this came from both shutting things down in the pandemic and then was subsequently exacerbated by the conflict. Um, and what that what the, we've seen as Space Forge is, so our focus is on producing next generation compound semiconductors in space. By producing semiconductors in space, you can create 10 to 100 times performance improvements in those chips when they're used back on the ground. That's not a capability Europe has had. Um, you know, we have quite a small semiconductor industry compared to North America, compared to Taiwan and what goes on in China. And here's really an opportunity for Europe to go forward and carve something out for itself. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been a key driver that that chip shortage exacerbated. Um, specifically, I've seen it in, in Germany and Ireland uh, and in the UK with our own compound semiconductor industry. But at the same time, the geopolitical tensions that that chip shortage have created around energy security, infrastructure, transport. Um, and these are all areas where um, really the, the space technologies that I think we're talking about here are able to support. Um, and I think that that message is... is has actually gotten through to to really cross European government, uh, and I'm actually quite excited about what's what's to come for that. I mean, you touched on, on a couple of things there. Um, also for ourselves, um, verticaliz verticalization is key. Um, we all agree that we have the right talent in, in Europe. We have the right um, right know how as well. So we like to keep it here and even in this area as well, what is manufacturing, um, because it's very rich in talents and, and, and companies that can support that. Um, on the other topic, you were, you were talking about sovereignty of, of, of communication, and I mean, that's what the, what the crisis uh, revealed as well. If, um, it's amazing that, that Starlink brought communication in, in times of, of crisis, but um, this is something that Europe should be thinking about, um, that an American company needs to come to Europe to deliver the services, and this is something that um, that that needs to be developed here and uh, and even exported, right? That's why the government at the moment is doing the right things, as you were mentioning, um, Josef. But I think um, it's it's not yet enough, right, to to really um, shorten the advantage other companies, uh, uh, other countries have, and we don't know what what other countries are doing exactly in that space, but I think we see it when they're up there. So yeah, on, on our side, we, we actually believe very strongly that sovereignty is uh, at this moment one, one of the huge trends that we see in the world. Uh, it has started way before uh, the Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine war. Uh, it has started, to be perfectly honest, some 10 years ago maybe. Uh, we see China being less and less interested in really cooperating with uh, countries like Germany. Uh, we see uh, in the US is more and more uh, turning into sovereignty mode. Um, also in the EU, we see some, some forces to disintegrate. Uh, so uh, we have built our company actually in that sense uh, a lot on the sovereignty topic. So we have a huge vertical integration that you already uh, mentioned. Uh, we have 80% uh, uh, of the production in-house, which is extremely untypically high. We have uh, uh, all our development tools, all our development software, all programmed in-house. Uh, it requires a lot of money, to be perfectly honest, up front. It requires a lot of know-how, but we said before, in Europe we have that. 
Um, we have also been so paranoid to have uh, um, raw materials on stock for at least eight rockets. So that will uh, bring us somewhere into 2024 almost. Uh, in order to be to be able to react on uh, economic crisis, uh, chip crisis, uh, we have basically since we have our design tools in house, we can easily switch. So whichever chip I can buy, we can build in. It's not a problem. Uh, so we built the, the whole company uh, in this uh, uh, based on this sovereignty thing. Uh, and therefore, me as a, a, a chief operating officer, I can sleep well at night uh, because I know my company will still work tomorrow and next year. <laughs> so, uh, Nicholas, did you have a comment or? No, no. no. Okay. I, I was just going to ask, what, what kind of raw materials and can can I buy some? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, price is going up and up, but uh, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we shall take it afterwards, maybe. But you bring up a good point, right? There's there's the challenges or the opportunities associated with. Um, the desire for sovereignty and how that supports this new space economy. There's the challenges associated with supply chains, but then there's also the motivation to build robustness into how the company functions, so it's less brittle than perhaps you know previous decades supply chains had been, which is a, I think a positive long-term investment, which is pretty exciting to see. Yeah, that's uh, definitely. Uh, I have to stress that it's yeah. super important when you when you build uh, supply chains that are uh, eight different steps or so, the likelihood it breaks up is almost 100%. If you reduce that to two or three steps, uh, you're the winner in this world. So now if we, if we kind of flip to the other side, um, after success, right, now we have a lot of things in space uh, and it starts to become congested and, and no one country owns space, right? It's, it's a, a neutral territory, so to speak, at least for now. Um, how do we address this growing space debris issue? Um, I think you, get, you are all very focused on bringing your part of the economy to bear, and it takes an incredible amount of time and energy and capital, but yet it leads to this situation which, in a different way, one can liken back to kind of the climate crisis we're in now, where right, the, the, the work that we put in to make people's lives better on Earth led to challenges longer term. What lessons should we take from that, and, and what can we do um, to, to start addressing space debris before it's a bigger problem. Um, yeah, I mean, what you were saying is um, before it becomes a problem, right? Everything that goes up uh, needs, to, needs to come down or needs to, needs to do orbit. So that should be a, a minimum requirement of everything that, that, that goes up there and is new. Right, so we also have systems um, that are double to deorbit either the satellites or to um, to bring them into atmosphere and then they uh, tracelessly um, burn. Um, so, so that would be the, the the first thing. And then we have uh, other great new space companies as well, which are up there uh, cleaning up. Um, it still needs a, a regulation, um, a regulative framework for it. It needs law. It needs uh, government enforcement. Um, that's 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 what's needed, but it's also a business for for others to grasp from. I mean, if we look at the the material uh, shortage, um, and especially for you guys uh, as well, if you could stay up there and produce up there, I don't know if this is an, an idea. So, uh, I, I mean, happy to, happy to come off that. So, one of the reasons why we chose to develop our own infrastructure to produce things in space was because we could see that there was the capacity and need for that technology now, but that we couldn't wait for some of these future stations to come online. And that actually by the point that they are online, then we've got the capacity to scale up our payload and produce semiconductors in the tens of millions for them. What I would say though is one of the key things and one of the reasons why we started Space Forge was we didn't feel that space technology went far enough when it came to sustainability. We should have been thinking about sustainability on day one when we put that first satellite into space, and we didn't. Space is the last true landfill that we have as humanity. We put things up there and then we either shift it to what we call graveyard orbit, which quite frankly is a polite way of saying a rubbish dump, or we burn it up in our atmosphere. And, uh, and that burning up in our atmosphere, while it's traceless in terms of it doesn't leave debris and things to come back to Earth, it does leave harmful particles in the upper layers of our atmosphere, which then exacerbates the effect of greenhouse gases and the way that that cycle works. So our return technology, uh, Pridwin, which is named after the mythical shield of King Arthur, um, if you're a myth geek like I am, um, is platform agnostic. 
it works at 40 kilos, 400 kilos, four tons. We're yet to find the limit where that return technology stops working. And we've been working with some of those debris removal companies to move that conversation forward. This isn't about burning things. This isn't about single use. This is about the opportunity that even if you can't refurbish those missions when they return, at least for the first time ever, you can recycle a satellite on the ground and take those rare earth metals and use them again and again and again. And we've never had that opportunity before. Um, and I think that's that's the way that very quickly we're going to have to shift because we need to move away from this single-use mindset when it comes to space. Uh, g going off that, so I think I've I've heard a lot, or we've heard a lot, you know, space debris, the issue of space debris, sort of being likened to climate change on Earth. Um, that's kind of true. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a bad analogy. Um, but the one thing that you have with space debris that you don't have with climate change on Earth, at least not to my knowledge, is there's this constant worry that um, the potential for it to grow is exponential, right? Because if you have one thing that you send into space and it hits another thing that already broke up in space, that creates some space debris, and then you send it up again, and then at some point you reach some critical mass where there's just no more space in space for you to send things without creating more space debris. Um, and really, the way to solve that is first of all to understand where the debris is in the first place because things in space, they tend to move around. They don't like to stay in one place. Um, and uh, really the way to do that is, is you know, path analysis um, to, to, to look around and see what's up there. And, and some of our customers are doing that. We're enabling that. Um, so, so I think that's definitely one thing that needs to be done. Cleaning up once you know where the debris is for sure, that's something you need to do as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, re referring back to us, we're reusable, we don't stay in space. We, we, we come back down. So I think that's, that's our in input on the topic. Yeah, so on, on our end, uh, being a launch uh, service provider, so uh, the launch vehicle, we don't uh, contribute ourselves uh, to, to any space debris. Uh, however, what we, we can say is uh, it is, the top topic is on the table very strongly. Uh, we have a very good overview of what our customers want and a lot of them actually uh, uh, ask it, first of all, or are actually even uh, active. So, so one of our biggest customers is active in the space debris removal. Um, and uh, so that will definitely come more and more. And I personally also believe that it's going to be in the future a regulatory uh, requirement to uh, remove that uh, uh, rubbish uh, Absolutely. later on. Yeah, so you, you mentioned you know the role of governments before. This is a perfect place for a governmental agency to come in and regulate and say, listen, uh, we have some pretty strict requirements when it comes to space debris, what you're allowed to leave behind, et cetera. We, we need those rules. Great answers. Um, sticking with the theme of climate change, uh, I think another challenge that we all likely often hear is with so many problems on Earth, right? why should we be investing so many billions in going to space? Uh, I want to give each of you a chance to kind of respond to that and, and help um, make ends meet in terms of uh, why investing in this now uh, is beneficial to climate change and, and how we address perhaps some of the climate impact of some of the activities that we are doing, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's propellant, whether it's kind of whatever other um, uh, emissions that the new space industry might create. <coughs> Happy to take that one first. Um, so our, our mission at Space Forge is to make space work for humanity. On day one when we started that company, we started calculating our CO2 emissions. Literally the first Domino's pizza and the three pints of cider that we had went into that calculator. And importantly, the reason that we did that is because it's our goal to be the world's first truly carbon negative space company. I don't mean we're going to buy offsets and, and plow things into, into forests and so forth and say, look how great we are. I mean, truly, we are looking to create solutions which on the ground prevent more CO2 than it took to create. Um, and what I would, what I would say to, to add to that is that as space has been a great tool for pointing out problems exist. We can point to, you, we, we can use Earth observation satellites to demonstrate that there's deforestation in the Amazon, that there's an oil spill in the Gulf. But you still need a solution and people on the ground to go and clean that oil up or solve that problem. In space manufacturing is the first opportunity we've had to directly leverage that space environment to do something which can actually benefit here um, and us and, and really redress the balance between both humans and how we interact with the natural resources of our planet without damaging it further than we have to. Yeah, if, if I could just p uh, piggyback off that, because I, I was more or less going to say the, the, something similar. So I think that 
the reason why we hear that challenge a lot is that when people think about space exploration and going to space, they think about maybe a guy in his, you know, like sort of Rolls Royce shaped spaceship blasting off into space, you know, kind of paying millions of dollars to, to, to get up there, polluting the Earth's atmosphere in the process. It's really not what happens during space exploration or anything that any of us are doing. So uh, at no point, nowhere, are we uh, more confronted with resource scarcity than in space, okay? Um, I'll give you two examples of technologies that have been developed basically as a result of the confrontation with resource scarcity in space. Semi-permeable membranes to filter water. That was first basically used on the ISS. Um, there's a kind of plastic which gets used by astronauts to pack food, which can then be used as a powder um, to use actually in a 3D printer. Now, imagine if we recycled the plastics that are wasted on Earth put them in a 3D printer, and I don't know, printed some of these chairs with them. So I think we can, we can actually learn a lot from the, the, this uh, smart way of thinking, this efficiency that goes on in space. Um, yeah. Great examples. And also a, a couple of more examples. I mean, also um, organoids in space, right? I mean, cells, uh, cells have been sent up, and they're more likely to grow in, in, in orbit. Um, so this could be a, a path for, for, for the better of humanity. Um, but also for, for, for ourselves, I mean, Earth observation, if we don't monitor uh, where the CO2 is coming from or who are the bigger, bigger polluters, what, what do regulations um, um, then, then have an effect on? So monitoring the Earth, I think the question is not that how we contribute, but what happens if, if we don't do it. Space can be a huge contributor to the challenges we have in observing um, and, uh, and then also mitigating the, the effects on it. Yeah, I can uh, I can only uh, pick up the the ball here. So uh, I think uh, space cannot only contribute. It 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 is one of the key contributors to actually uh, f uh, measuring uh, climate change. So uh, almost half the sensors that detect climate change are actually located in space already. Um, we can detect oil spills much earlier than you would uh, on the ground. Uh, you can uh, uh, help precision farming. Uh, meaning you need much less uh, uh, chemistry uh, to farm. So, and all these are concrete examples that already are active today. Uh, and the market is only moving towards uh, getting, uh, uh, let's say, Earth more and more smarter. Uh, and through that, preventing much, much more uh, CO2 than the industry usually emits. I can confirm that because the rocket launch itself is probably contributes the most, most of CO2, and we have heavily invested to decrease that. Uh, so we are much less uh, CO2 intensive than uh, uh, current rockets. Um, but still, when we do the math, what uh, uh, rocket launches and satellites cost me in production and operation, uh, it uh, it pays back 100-fold, 1,000-fold easily. Awesome. Uh, and I want to, I'm giving a, you a heads up now. We'll spend the last two minutes each uh, just so you can tell an awesome story in the journey that you guys have had so far building a new space company. I find that the stories um, from, from this class of company tend to be very exciting at the very least. So something to, to start thinking about. The last question I'll ask um, is really just around um, how we should think about the commercial aspects of new space, uh, more specifically business models. And if we think that those are going to be similar to business models that startups and companies are currently using on traditional, say, SaaS companies, or if we think that the way in which investors, governments, partners should be thinking about the business models for new space companies should shift slightly. Um, so I, I don't know to the degree to which you guys have encountered that, and your answer might simply be, oh, we use a very traditional business model. It doesn't need to evolve. That's fine. But I want to give you the opportunity to kind of talk about how mentalities might want to shift uh, with this new industry. I think that the, the biggest shift is already at the at the beginning, right? If you compare it to a SaaS uh, company, it's very very capital intensive, and in our business, um, if if you cannot demonstrate flight heritage, it's really hard to then to then really get to the commercial um, contracts. And that I would say, compared to other companies we have built, is the is the most eye opening um, experience that you need so much capital, so much time to get there. You need to do so many things, and without failing. Um, and then you really get to to uh, to the commercial um, business models. Yet, 
Um, it's also a shift that that investors need to need to make on how, how to place their bet and also how we work with governments. Very 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 important to understand. Um, on our side, I mean, I think I think we touched on this before when we talked about service contracts, right? Um, the, the question is, what kind of service do you want to sell and when? So um, I think I mentioned before, you know, we see our core business really is going towards servicing satellites. That means food supplies, water supplies, oxygen supplies, spare parts, tools, the kinds of things that you need to run space stations. And we really think that's where the money is in, in the mid to long term, um, even with the space stations orbiting around the moon. Um, however, in, in between, you, you do need some, some money in there. You know, as you mentioned, it's, it's pretty capital intensive to develop a, a spacecraft like this. Um, the good news is that you know, up until you have an operational spacecraft which can service a, a satellite, um, or maybe even the moon, um, there's a lot of test flying. There's a lot of test flights. And you can fly payloads in those test flights. You can sell uh, payloads. So we, um, we actually have a pretty aggressive schedule. We're flying twice a year up until you know, we actually become, start, start producing the series product. Um, uh, you, our, our 24 mission, which is a subscale demonstrator of the flight, which will fly in 2026, is 80% booked now. So 80% booked means there's still 20% left. So if anyone wants to send anything to space, uh, talk to me after the, talk to me after the, the meeting. Um, so really sort of leveraging on, on those kinds of business models that are, that are working right now. So um, in-orbit demonstration, um, microgravity testing, um, uh, entertainment, it, it is there, and some defense, mainly surveillance-based. Right now, while you're sending you know, your, your, your spacecraft up to test, basically, there's no reason why you can't. Um, I think that that's a model which um, is going to work really well for us, and it's also something that gives, us, uh, gives our investors a lot of confidence in us because it means we don't stay, you know, revenue-less until we actually begin with our core business. Uh, so I'm not a software guy, um, so I can't, I can't really comment on SaaS, but I would say that from my experience, um, and <laughs> I'm guessing a few of his here have probably come from some of those European incumbents like Airbus and Talis Alenia, and there are reasons why we left. Um, but importantly, it is possible, I think, to balance both product and service-led business models at the same time. Uh, microgravity, um, just being able to return from space, the science that you can conduct atmospherically on the way down all offer interesting opportunities for you to generate ancillary revenue while you, while you build to the main product. But I think with the stage of the companies that we are here, it's not about what we're doing in 10 years, it's about what we're doing in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Um, you know, some of the companies here, and I'd like to include myself in that, you're looking at, you know, really the, the next Apple or the next ARM or the next 3M. And I think it's possible to balance that with being able to provide research services to interesting new microgravity products. When we started SpaceForge, we started with a list of seven things we could make in space profitably and still bring back. Um, when we got our first fundraise, that list grew to the wonderful magic number of 42, and now it stands at over 100. Um, and each of those things you can exploit just as an advanced material basis. But if you can create something like a new type of semiconductor, which on the ground you can't make, you're the best at making that material or that crystal, then you're the best at designing on it, the best at uh, doing the lithography, the dicing, the packaging, the subsystem integration, and all of a sudden you've got something that looks very close to that ARM-like company or that Apple-like company, but is able to really leapfrog where we are with today's technology by 25, 50 years. So uh, I think you were asking uh, uh, what, uh, how can we change uh, uh, the perception of, uh, of uh, space. Um, and I think we can not only change it for, towards investors uh, or uh, instead I think we can actually change it towards uh, uh, everybody, towards uh, every single person. And uh, one nice story that I have actually there is uh, we got the visit by the Swedish king. So we had a mass. We have a massive uh, rocket test site in uh, active in Sweden. So he visited us, uh, and he went to the rocket engine test uh, test stand. Uh, he had never seen something like that before. Uh, so we built the first one in in Sweden, and he asked, uh, uh, "Do you set my beautiful country on fire here?" 
And <laughs> funnily, uh, luckily enough, I had enough time to to explain to him that uh, no, of course, of course, we're we're trying not to, uh, but uh, instead, uh, and it was the time where there was heavy wildfires in in Sweden ongoing as well. Uh, I explained to him the rockets that we built uh, bring, and it's one of our uh, biggest customers, a Munich-based company, by the way, Aurora Tech, uh, brings uh, uh, built satellites that can detect forest fires. And to close it off, uh, um, uh, maybe this this question, um, it's, it's one of those factors, why can we uh, uh, reduce CO2 so much uh, in uh, with a space? So 5% of the worldwide uh, CO2 emissions um, are actually due to wildfires. If you detect the wildfires extremely early, you firefighters, local firefighters can put them out instantly and you just cancel those 5%. Um, and that's a massive contribution. Uh, I think that everybody can understand. The Swedish king understood it extremely well, and he went uh, home to his castle with a really good feeling. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, space industry is in this case a huge contributor in in, in Germany and uh, Europe-wide in the world, definitely. Very cool. All right, we have five minutes or so left. I want to open it up to you guys. Uh, if you have a story or two that you want to tell, probably one per, uh, please feel free to to share. I can I can I can start. So I can I can tell you about the week I've had. Basically, there's not there's not a, a story, but it's more of a week. So um, on Monday, I was trying to solve my raw material problem uh, in France. Uh, Tuesday, I flew to our site in Bordeaux. We have a site in Bordeaux. Um, very, I would say, normal-looking offices. You would never think that uh, there's anything uh, funky going on there. Um, but seriously, you know, some of the some of the best people in space, like 300 combined years of space experience, just sitting there, really just working. Um, and then on uh, Thursday, we celebrated our first birthday. So uh, congratulations! Yeah. So exactly, exactly one year and one day ago, um, we were in, we were founded. Uh, by some people who left uh, Airbus space, basically, and decided to go do their own thing. Um, now we've, I think, raised uh, over 11 million euros from three tier one VCs, the Promus, Cherry, V squared, um, uh, who all attended. And we we walked into our AIT hall, uh, Assembly Integration Testing Hall, um, to see uh, the uh, very small subscale demonstrator we call Bikini. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's basically just a capsule. It's about yay big, like this. Uh, but it's going to space, and uh, we built it in under a year. And I think that's pretty cool. You know, I think that's pretty cool. We're flying, basically, or we're delivering something for flight within a year of being founded. That's cool. That is cool. And it also sounds like uh, this birthday party was the most appropriate time to have space cakes ever. Uh, I won't ask you what you guys did, but uh, it sounds like a... I might have to write down a note for next year. Then. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I just told a story about the Swedish king. My most other, <laughs> most of my other stories are probably very painful, uh, or not for the public ears. So uh, I, 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 I can't uh, even think of one. But uh, definitely from from my experience, uh, first of all, founding a company uh, in the space industry is something of of the greatest things that you can you can definitely uh, do. Uh, but uh, uh, most likely, uh, and that uh, pr probably brings uh, closest the story to, to the beginning of a bit, um, it is not so easy in Europe. So things are uh, definitely, could mu be much better. I read back then in New Zealand, you can found a company within uh, three days. Uh, in the US, I think it's like, uh, depending on the state, something between five and uh, 15 days. Uh, in Europe, I didn't have uh, health insurance for half a year uh, because they couldn't tell me if I need private or state health insurance. It took them half a year to, to uh, clarify that. Uh, so that's probably, uh, after the funny Swedish King story, a more serious one, uh, which is something that uh, here in Germany, but generally here in Europe, we, we should work upon. Regulatory gap. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's pretty bad. So I went full time uh, on Spaceforge the same week that Boris Johnson announced the first lockdown in the UK. Um, in five days, I moved house. We won our first contract, closed our first fundraise, and I quit my job. Uh, and then on the fifth day, my mum called me and told me off. 
for quitting my job in a national recession and global pandemic. Um, and so we operated without a building for 13 months. Um, we were literally ready to move into a very cool lab um, in a semiconductor kind of cluster ecosystem. Um, but then all of the pandemic and all of the lockdowns prevented that from happening. Um, you have to get really creative as a startup. We were using um, university labs after hours. We built a semiconductor chamber uh, in a spare bedroom. We uh, had to pay uh, one of our first team members, landlords, uh, his deposit because we were experimenting with an alloy payload and he managed to burn through the carpet. Um, and none of this would have happened if, we, if we'd had this facility, but the resilience that it builds in a team that's growing at that kind of pace. And at the time, because we were all in lockdown and we were at the time, I think, spread across six or seven countries. So we were shipping kind of space flight prototypes to Romania, to Croatia, then to Italy, and then some software was being worked on in Brazil. And then we had to deal with the export of that back into the EU and then back out to the UK. Um, and I have to say, it was probably some of the most fun 13 months of my life. Um, and being able to finally meet some of those team members that we'd never been able to meet in person on the day when we finally got to pick up the keys to that first unit in Cardiff um, was quite frankly, it was pretty emotional. Um, but it's it's a growth story that you can only ever experience in those early stages when you're when you're working with 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 those people, you know, day in and day out. Uh, and it's such a fantastic and rewarding experience. Um, and I fundamentally, I think I think starting a company is really one of the best learning experiences you could ever do. Yeah, and it's also a chance to to do something something good, right? I mean, we're talking about what about our business model um, going to subscription model as well from from satellites. But I think one of the most rewarding thing is um, that we actually um, started talking with uh, with um, Sea Shepherd, actually, uh, where we're talking about the subscription model that if a if a satellite is not used by a, by a customer anymore. Why not donate it to Sea Shepherd, for example, because they need it to really see where the fishing grounds are and, and what you can do. And that's where you then can see from what you're doing, it has a direct impact on where we live and, uh, and the, the greater humanity. And that, besides building a great company, um, I think is very rewarding that we're leaving, leaving a footprint here for the force of good. Perfect. Well, we are on time to the dots. Please join me in giving a hand to our speakers. Thank you guys for coming with us.